they destroy the biodiversity when the white settlers were uh, invading North America. And same with Australia also. Most of its uh, biodiversity was destroyed during the invasion by Europeans. Uh, same in uh, New Zealand also. So they hardly have uh, any biodiversity worth left. And even they, even when they have large number of threatened species, those are not uh, coming into the listing. So one of the listed animals, for example, is African elephant or elephant, Asian elephant also. African elephant has an excess population in southern Africa. And its ivory is also an economic resource. By banning this ivory from international trade, the countries that suffer are a few developing countries, not any Western country. Therefore, CITES is a good platform for Western countries to display a lot of environmental spirit and pretend that they are, you know, environment friendly. And uh, there are, you know, large uh, NGOs with uh, huge uh, fundraising needs also involved. You know, they show pictures of elephants and large mammals and so on. And because ITIS is not involving uh, species that are economically important to Western countries, it's uh, successful and they allow. And another convention in the in the physical environment that is successful is the ozone layer convention or the Montreal uh, Protocol within the convention that depletes, uh, depletes the ozone layer. This protocol was to replace the substances that reduce the ozone layer, namely the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. And this was a, a successful convention. The CFCs were replaced in many countries and the ozone layer also uh, showed up signs of uh, recovery. And why was this successful? Because the radiation that comes to the earth because of the absence or because of the hole in the ozone layer affects disproportionately the population that is devoid of melanin pigment in their skin. That is the white people, the Caucasians. And because it affects the Caucasian populations wherever they are, the Western countries were very serious about addressing the ozone layer depletion and therefore they provided technology support, they provided financial support and so on. Whereas so far what we know as impact of a global warming is largely in the developing world, the floods, the desertification, the rise in uh, sea level, the failure of crops, uh, and most of those uh, pandemics, uh, you know, the, the new diseases for humans and also for the crops are happening in the developing countries. And therefore, the Western countries are not so serious about real solutions. Now, they are also witnessing floods, huge floods in, in, the, in, the, in the rivers in Europe. And also a lot of wildfires are also happening. So that is a picture only when it affects not the larger part of humanity, but when it affects the white people, there will be serious solutions coming up. That could be the reason why those two conventions um, are particularly successful and the others are not so successful. Uh, thank 
Hello, Dr. Tracy. Uh, there are two uh, special, our special guests, uh, Dr. Parit Bhava Khan and uh, Ms. Rotama. I would like to uh, put point some questions in the last session. So, I invite Dr. Parit Bhava Khan to have a comment. Uh, hello, am, am, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, Dr. Paisi, good evening. Good evening. You have made an excellent presentation on the various aspects of uh, the environment, especially focusing on uh, biodiversity and the climate change. Uh, the, the concept is uh, explains the structural aspects and also functional aspects. I would like to have a brief on the impact of this biodiversity and climate on poverty, especially in developing countries. Was there any effort to quantify or relate this to this poverty? Can you please briefly explain this? Uh, there, were, there were efforts to determine or assess the the economic value of biodiversity uh, and ecosystem services. Um, in 1995, there was uh, one multi uh, international team of multidisciplinary experts, 12 people, they put together a paper uh, after a lot of research led by someone called an economist called uh, Costanza. And they gave a figure of $33 trillion um, value for biodiversity and ecosystem services in one year. So if a uh, trillion is a huge figure, uh, one followed by 11 zeros. But to put that in perspective, at that time, the global total... Uh, GDP was a $28 trillion, so the value was a even more than the more than the global combined GDP. Now, that was also when the CBD was uh, alive and kicking, and then the Western countries were trying to weaken it, and their weakening process have intensified and uh, you know, it's now almost complete. Now, although this um, huge amount of uh, economic value is there for biodiversity and ecosystem services, we also find areas of poverty or extreme poverty and areas of biodiversity richness overlapping. That is, uh, whether it is in uh, Gujarat or in uh, Mauritius or anywhere. For example, in, uh, in Gujarat, Gujarat eastern part has uh, three, four mountains and each mountain is uh, rich in forest. In the north you have Aravalli, then uh, somewhere in the middle, that is the eastern side, in the middle, you have the Bindya and Satpura, and in the south, you have the Rastangas, either starting or ending, whatever you want to call it. And that is also quite rich in biodiversity, but that is also the area where you have uh, endemic poverty, extreme poverty, mostly of uh, Adivasi population. And in some places, uh, even when people are educated uh, in one village, you can find at least two, three uh, graduates, uh, tribal Adivasi populations. They don't have jobs. They don't have any livelihood. Well, why the mining companies are there and they are rich and they are extracting uh, the, the resource, the mining resources from there and also forest is also destroyed. I've seen that in in Gujarat, in the last 15 years, 
they destroyed as much forest as they have now. They have 7% of the, the land area covered by forest. And almost the same amount of forest was legally destroyed under the Forest Conservation Act. And a lot more are uh, illegally, you know, legally destroyed means you take a permission to destroy and then uh, far more area were also destroyed illegally. But at the same time, you keep the people locked out of the resource. The resource, the same, very same resource that these people have been protecting and using. So that is the paradox, that is the irony. And now that picture is uh, spreading across, uh, you know, other forest regions of the country, especially in areas. areas. So it's very, not of course an optimistic picture, uh, you know, where you have biodiversity, huge value, but people not benefiting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bill Experts. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Doctor and uh, uh, Mr. Pari Pavakan. If I have two more questions. Before that, uh, Madam Bhattama had uh, some one question. I will read it out. What do you make of attempts to put a monetary value of the service under the uh, quotation? Uh, the service forest renders seems a useless enterprises to me. But there is now serious, serious scholarship on it. I think this also addresses uh, what I was uh, just saying. So this is happening. People are putting monetary value. And um, people are also, that is basically when I say people, <laughs> in this case it is in the corporations. The multinational corporations in particular and their, their domestic uh, partners. And this is uh, happening everywhere, wherever natural solutions to the environmental crisis are to come. You now they, they are diverting it into financial um, discourse where the corporates will have a stake and an involvement. They are talking about uh, eco ecosystem services, um, something that can be commodified and sold, and where companies will come and uh, invest and uh, they generate uh, so-called ecosystem services for which they will get uh, profits. So that kind of debate is uh, completely a disservice to the attempts to resolve the environmental crisis and therefore the crisis will only deepen it will only deepen when these kind of false solutions are thrust upon us and the, there are no serious attempts to question this that is the that is the issue earlier at some point there were you know the civil society was quite uh, effective but now they are not no longer, you know, uh, different from the corporate world. Some of many of them are part and parcel of the the corporate agenda, and therefore we don't get real, serious, dissenting questions heard or interventions made. And even and then on the other hand, the globalization process has also done something very special like the the national capitalists are also part of the global system so um, like earlier there was at least a sense of domestic uh, issues or but that is no longer the case uh, the, the domestic corporates are, are now ha, have now become an extension of the multinational corporations. So the there is a parallel world now, or the real world is the world of the corporates. They comprise one role without distinction, 
of uh, of country and they rule over us they rule rule over the environment they rule over the natural resources and even the solutions to create and the, even the attempts to create solutions to the environmental crisis are also hijacked by them to create avenues for more profits to reinforce the powers of the the corporate world and that has to be challenged that has to be exposed very consistently thank you yes uh, thank you professor ji and uh, one question uh, this uh, uh, you have already uh, mentioned in your speech but uh, for a better elaboration i would like to ask one more point uh, two more points one uh, as you explained uh, the world is world and its uh, ecosystem itself are under the rule of imperial system and the brutal penetration exploitation of its corporate new liberal corporate finance capital and uh, the most uh, damaging situation is generated due to this in the almost all the new colonial countries in this situation what do you uh, how do you analyze the bio piracy uh, are existing in this uh, current period and how do you think to uh, resist on this uh, serious issues that is a one uh, point okay. bio piracy is uh, serious and the uh, cbd the convention on biological diversity was uh, a serious effort to stem the tide of bio piracy that was happening but unfortunately that did not help much even within the convention there was a protocol created nagaya protocol on access and benefit sharing related to biodiversity that came into force sometime in 2010 and uh the cbd or the protocol does not prevent the transfer of biodiversity or does not deny access to biodiversity but it provides a conditions the three conditions that i had mentioned earlier but then that is not clearly followed um the convention came into force in 1993 after signature in 1992 it was after that year two huge uh, cases cases of huge bio piracy happened in kerala from nelliyambadi a british citizen came nelliyambadi in uh, palakkad district of kerala he came he even set up a big laboratory there he extracted the medicinal plants and took the mave from the country without any permission of the even he had a some local collaborate another is something from a government uh, institution tbgra tropical botanical garden uh, in palur jivanur district uh, which is also located in a biodiversity rich area palur peringamala panchayat so the director of uh, that government institution had an agreement with a pharmaceutical company an american pharmaceutical company their branch in uh, singapore um a lot of talk uh, about this was uh, published in uh, malayalam vaidika and also malayalam weekly and also kerala sada and this uh, nelliyambadi issue was uh, reported uh, uh, quite frequently in a hindu newspaper those days um, uh, uh, but nothing has uh, happened the guy he left the country without being caught and in this case a tbgri uh, it's a, it's a famous american company uh, pharmaceutical company uh, it's not i'm just not quickly remembering it so under this agreement some 400 species of plants the most critical uh, medicinal plants of our forests were collected and they 
gem blossoms were transferred to this company uh, in Singapore. So this was exposed by these uh, newspapers and then the, the director of that institution was uh, forced to resign. I think this happened during the Achyutanandan LDF government. He was forced to resign, but then uh, it was BGP government at the center, Bajpayee government. So Bajpayee government made him director of the Lucknow Botanical uh, Research Center. And subsequently he was made a member of the National Biodiversity Authority, which was supposed to uh, control uh, biopiracy or check biopiracy in our country. So even though we did not have the National Biodiversity Authority and the Biodiversity Act at that time, the CBD was in force. At that time, or even today, we can take action against the countries involved in the biopiracy and those institutions using uh, CBD platform and also our own Biodiversity Act for that. And this biopiracy is happening with uh, from other developing countries also because it's uh, you know huge potential and uh, eighty percent of the global biodiversity is housed in uh, in southern countries, develop, developing countries. Thank you. So in this connection, uh, how do you think how effective the existing Forest uh, Protection Act and uh, what is the status of the forest coverage at present in our country? The forest coverage in India is uh, is assessed every two years uh, by the Forest Survey of India in Dharadun and uh, they come out uh, with the statistics of that time and it is about uh, 21% of the land area of the country is covered by forest. But then sometimes it can be a misleading figure because um, it can be misleading because uh, it's only the green cover. So there, there are plantations, even coconut plantations are also seen in the satellite pictures. It's a, you know, uh, Sadly, it's picture-based uh, analysis. So, uh, some plant, uh, rubber plantations, coconut plantations, tea gardens can also be counted as a forest cover. And more importantly, you destroy original forest, the primary forest, and you create even forest plantations through the joint forest management and so on. But those are actually secondary forests, not primary original forests. And those are not the complex system of forest system, biodiversity system, ecosystem that you must have. And therefore, it's a, it's a can also be misleading. That is, that is one thing. We need uh, actually a realistic assessment of the forest. You know, it needs a lot of infrastructure and manpower and all that. But still, we need to have in order to get a clear picture of the forest covering the country. And by the way, the government, the forest policy sets the target of 33% of forest. Um, that is only in the north northeastern countries 30 percent 33% is there in kerala i should say that uh, we have you know two kinds of the the actual forest cover estimated by the forest survey of india for kerala is 52% whereas the notified forest the legal forest or the forest under the control or jurisdiction of the forest department is only 29%. So, in my view, we should be actually looking at the forest cover and not just what is under the jurisdiction of the forest department because even the Supreme Court has given a... Uh, in one of its uh, orders, it has 
mentioned that uh, the forest cover, the forest, not just the legal forest, uh, notified forest, but uh, the dictionary meaning of forest applies when forest is converted or known for forestry purposes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Faisi. Uh, at this conclusion, concluding session, uh, I would like to ask uh, one more uh, question. Uh, uh, interlinking your personal uh, experience and history with uh, our uh, objectives as uh, from our party. As you know, this uh, lecture series is a part of our 12th Party Congress. A decade ago, our party has uh, uh, adopted in our document with, uh, one of the five principal conditions is capital and nature. Uh, and then onwards, we were in the forefront of very forefront for various environmental protection movement for the protection of ecology and sustainable development all over the country and also initiated in uh, our international platform in various countries. At the local level. Now, the 12th Party Congress document also emphasizes on the urgent need of uh, broad masses, broad level uh, uh, movement to protect the ecology, the planet at this catastrophic state, and uh, for the sustainable development and for the people's movement for the protection of the ecosystem. Uh, for that, uh, internationally, as well as a part of that in, the, in our country also, an important and um, urgent initiative is required. So, in that question, because you have been at the forefront of many historical environmental movements, especially some of the pioneering movements in Kerala and the country, like uh, Silent Valley movement in the, in the 70s and the 80s, and uh, Plachimara movement in the late 80s and 90s. So, looking back on this moment, how how you look back on this moment and connecting to the present serious critical stage of the global ecosystem? And uh, what is your uh, uh, suggestion? for the urgent initiative uh, for the protection of our the very existence of our, the planet Earth. Uh, on Plachimada, um, it's a it's both a positive story and also uh, one that is also disappointing. A positive story is that. Uh, the people have won in taking on a multinational giant and forcing them to close down their plant factory. So that part was good. And the next part was the compensation part, polluter peace principle, which is a globally recognized uh, principle and also is part of uh, the jurisprudence uh, in our country. So I was uh, made a member of uh, this uh, committee for the Plachimada High Power Committee established by the Kerala government and we estimated the damage. The financial cost of the environmental damage caused by the Coca-Cola company. Earlier we were saying the financial uh, quantification of potential of biodiversity and ecosystem service and probably this is the first time the cost of environmental damage was uh, estimated um, in the country and most probably you know I don't see many examples in other countries also so we estimated the damage uh, minimum damage at 2016 uh, crore rupees and the law a bill was created and then for creating a tribunal for a compensation from the Coca-Cola company and 
this was sent to the sender and the Congress government uh, kept delaying approval. There was actually no need to send it to the sender for presidential assent because the law was created within the constitution power vested in the state assembly based on state subjects. Uh, damages uh, in the agriculture sector, damages in the health sector, um, land issues, labor issues, agriculture, all these are state subjects. There was no need to send it there, but something mysterious happened because uh, Coca-Cola was not able to operate in, in Chivantram, uh, government secretary, probably, you know, Delhi, it will be easy for them to play. But the Congress government kept uh, asking questions and delaying it for a long time, for five years or more. They didn't have the courage to deny it. They wanted to deny it, but they didn't have the courage. But then as soon as the uh, Modi government or uh, India government came, they asked Kerala government to withdraw it, withdraw the bill. Uh, the government cannot withdraw bill, I think, or it's the it's a privilege of the assembly in creating bill. The Kerala government uh, did not yield, but then in a few months, they wrote a letter saying that the president has denied a presidential assent to the bill. And that closes the chapter. That was in 2000, late 2015. And the LDF government, the LDF then promised to address this issue, this issue in, the, in the, also they put this on the election manifesto, but nothing happened. And uh, the chief minister, Kandrai Vijayan, was not interested. Uh, and that was clear to me from the beginning. So now, the, in spite of the election manifesto promise, nothing has happened. All these years, uh, that is um, uh, for uh, some six years. So people are now agitating again for, you know, restoring the compensation process. They have also filed a case in the under the SCST Atrocities Act. I had also filed a case in the National Human Rights Commission. The commission, after two or three years, they have happily, you know, closed the chapter after having failed to even elicit a reply from the Chief Secretary of Kerala. And they told me that you are now free to go to the civil court for redress. So that was not surprising. That is the power of uh, the cola company. But still, uh, the people are uh, on the path of agitation, and uh, they are not going to easily give up. Now on the Silent Valley, I was active in it as a student uh, in 1979, 80 and so on. But when I look back, um, it was both good and also there are some issues. See, that was an issue that uh, kind of precipitated the environmental movement in Kerala and also contributed very significantly in building up or strengthening the environmental movement in the country. So it, you know, generated a lot of debate, a lot of environmental groups sprang up and many of these environmental issues or development issues were discussed in multiple platforms and so on. But then uh, one self-criticism, if I may, is that uh, we were at that time talking about uh, focusing on one or two species like uh, lion tail macaque and so on. Or we were talking about a world in forest, untouched forest. So after 
when I grew up, maybe some 10 years later, I visited the place once again and found uh, coffee plantations. Remnants of coffee plantations right inside the Silent Valley Forest. So our claim of virgin forest was actually not true. These coffee plantations were created by the colonialists. They destroy a huge lot of forest there to create these uh, coffee plantations and also created uh, you know, the access path for taking truck to bring uh, you know, huge uh, timber from the forest. And then what we forgot at that time or ignored at that time was also the Adivasi people, especially the Kurumba community, they were also living in the vicinity and they were also frequenting this area and they were also part of that ecosystem. Now, as I, the, as I mentioned earlier, the indigenous people, the Adivasis, are the real custodians and caretakers of our forest. And that point is something that we ignored at that time. And that was a failure. And to me, the best uh, conservation law in our country now is the Forest Rights Act. The Forest Rights Act, in its preamble, says that this act is created to undo the historical injustice committed to the scheduled tribes of the country. That is for the first time an acknowledgement of the Indian state that we have committed in historical injustice to the Adivasi population and the indigenous people. And now we have a political formation ruling our country which even denies the very word Adivasi, the first people, the indigenous people. <coughs> they even call them Vanavasi instead of Adivasi because they are scared that if uh, the Adivasis are recognized as the first people or the first inhabitants and, you know, they will think, they, they are afraid that they will be then considered as uh, immigrants or settlers and so on. Therefore, they fear this very word Adivasi while they actually are the Adivasis. And in all Indian languages, Adivasi means the indigenous people, the first inhabitants. And they were the historical custodians of the forest. And still this day, even today, till date, the best forests of the country are found in the Adivasi districts. And they were also warriors, the frontline warriors against the British before our independence movement became, uh, took shape, you know, proper shape. Even before the war of 1857, there were numerous wars by the Adivasis against the British in the theatres of our forest. Numerous wars, right from the Daradun uh, hills to Vayanar, the Adivasi people were fighting and there were 103 such wars not very much celebrated, not very much recognized wars. And these were happening because of the British takeover of the forest. For, forest was the greatest resource of our country and they were taking it over for timber and also for mining. And the Adivasi people were protecting their forests, militantly fighting them. So giving back our forest to the Adivasi people who knows more about, about forests than any university educated experts is the only way to, to protect and also to sustainably use our forests. That should happen. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, Kansar, do you would like to ask any more comment? Uh, he has explained every aspect very clearly and uh, neatly, beautifully. 
so I don't want to intervene now. Because it is up to uh, 8 30 or so. Yes. Uh, yeah, time is uh, I congratulate uh, 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 congratulations on the AC for uh, spending all this in this uh, two hour period. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Paisi, also, this is for your excellent uh, uh, lecture and uh, the explanation for the question. So, at uh, this critical uh, period, uh, especially when we are under the neo-fascist rule, let us together unite to make an urgent initiative to resist from the protection of the global ecosystem and the people. Uh, with the initiative of the people's oriented ecologist, uh, uh, environmental scientist and uh, environmental activist and the masses, especially from the oppressed countries and all over the world and as a part of our country also. So let us hope for the togetherness and for the urgent initiative for this uh, course and for the better tomorrow. Uh, and thank you again for your valuable input for this dis discussion. Let us uh, continue the discussion and struggle and for more better understanding, to develop the better understanding.